there are three mindsets that I'd like to talk about in this time we have together. Um, but uh, since there was this HBR article that uh, essentially led to this honor of being invited to give this talk, maybe I'll give a, a, a bit of an introduction to how this came about. Um, and I'll start at the beginning. Uh, I mean the very beginning. So in addition to being born uh, at the CMC hospital in Bellor and starting life with a hospital card that says Mina's baby, uh, I actually had the privilege of growing up in the building in which uh, Dr. Ida Scudder founded a CMC as a one bed dispensary in uh, 1900, uh, which and the building now houses the offices and directors residence of the Christian Counseling Center. So like the uh, kids I grew up with, I was basically embedded in a faith-based ecosystem of nonprofits that was in one way or another uh, related to healthcare. And then I finished high school and uh, left home, eventually becoming a, uh, a business school academic, uh, first in the UK and then in China, as you heard. But then last year, the COVID uh, outbreak resulted in me coming back uh, to this building that I grew up in and what was intended to be a short stopover ended up becoming a six month uh, stay. And that was an opportunity I had to reflect on my roots. And I was quite convinced that there, are, there were important lessons from this world of nonprofits uh, that were, would be relevant to the world of business. Uh, and this conviction was because over the previous five years, I had begun uh, to get very interested in the 17 sustainable development goals uh, that had been had become an agenda for the world. And in particular, this idea of partnering for the goals, the 17th SDG. Uh, as all of you, I'm sure, are very uh, aware of, it was on the 25th of September, 2015, that the Sustainable Development Goals were formally adopted by the United Nations. And uh, the uh, uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, uh, described these goals as a universal, integrated, transformative vision for a better world. Fast forward four years uh, to the 25th of September, 2019, and his successor, Antonio Guterres, uh, called upon the world to treat the 2020s decade as a decade of action to renew with greater vigor and urgency efforts to pursue these sustainable development goals. And on that same day, uh, Bill Gates made an important speech in which he implicitly drew attention to the contribution of CMC's community health work, uh, which had resulted in admirable SDG outcomes in Velo District. And I stumbled upon a video clip of the speech during that uh, sojourn in Velo last year. And that triggered the idea that maybe there was something uh, to be gleaned from digging into the community health work. And thanks to the uh, excellent input I was fortunate to receive from Dr. Abram Joseph and, and others. Uh, coincidentally, exactly a year later, on the 25th of September, 2020, uh, this article appeared in uh, the Harvard Business Review. And uh, for those of you who have read it, you will know that I talk about three principles that uh, the world of business, I believe, can learn from how CMC has gone about doing things, pursuing uh, some goals in a sort of intermediate, oblique way, embracing seemingly contradictory objectives such as uh, affordability and quality, uh, and then doing more with less in a frugal or some may call austere uh, manner. Now, this was an attempt to take insights from the world of the nonprofits and share them with uh, the world of for-profit business. Uh, what I'm gonna attempt to do in this talk is the reverse. I would like to draw upon some ideas from my research from the world uh, of business and try and distill from that uh, three key uh, ideas, because in this decade of action, the, the pandemic has made it even more important, I believe, uh, to try to um, be very uh, uh, enterprising in how we go about 
trying to have a greater social impact on the world. And as uh, George has kindly uh, already uh, described, my work uh, deals with partnering between small companies and large companies. Um, and uh, I want to distill from these, uh, from, from this body of work, three key mindsets that I believe are important. Entrepreneurial, collaborative, and global mindsets, which not only are relevant in the context of what I do, which is talk about or study small and big companies partnering, but more generally about organizational transformation and ultimately about making, having a social impact by contributing to the sustainable development goals. So I'll start with the entrepreneurial mindset. And I would imagine that most people, when you think, uh, hear this term, would think of startups and entrepreneurs who are trying to pursue new opportunities. And if you look at what these people uh, do and how they go about doing things, you will normally find three characteristics. One is proactiveness, taking the initiative, not waiting to be asked, not reacting. Uh, a second is innovativeness, thinking outside of the box, looking for creative solutions. And a third is risk taking, that is acting without having certainty of outcomes. Now, this is not to say that one takes blind risks and is reckless. In fact, managing risk, sharing risk is an important part of this. Uh, but you have to accept that, of course, there is risk involved. But even beyond uh, the narrow world of entrepreneurship and starting a new business, if you think about what Dr. Ida Scudder and many others have done in her week, including the work uh, of the community health uh, department that I wrote about, uh, you will see proactiveness, innovativeness, and risk-taking. And so um, being entrepreneurial isn't just for startups. It's really about a mindset which all of us can really uh, adopt in what we do. And in the context of established companies, this notion that you still can be entrepreneurial has given rise to this term uh, called intrapreneurship, which is about adopting entrepreneurial attitudes inside of a bureaucratic organization. And uh, one of the classic examples of this in a big company called 3M that you're all familiar with, I'm sure, is the story of how these, these uh, ubiquitous yellow sticky notes, the post-its came about. It actually was the result of an intrapreneur called Dr. Silver Spencer, who had a sort of an unsuccessful outcome in one of his attempts to develop a new adhesive, but was very intrigued by the semi-sticky substance, which he felt convinced would have some application, but he was struggling to find out what that might be. And he, in his spare time during the lunch breaks, he would do brown bag presentations to other colleagues, describing what he had found and encouraging people to think about how this could be used. A few years later, um, another uh, manager called Art Fry, who used to sing in a choir and felt very frustrated with the bookmarks slipping out uh, from the hymn book, uh, came up with the idea of maybe using that funny semi-sticky substance to create notes that would be temporary bookmarks. And that in the end uh, resulted in the post-it notes and 3M have institutionalized this intrapreneurship within their company by allowing employees to have 15% of their time to work on projects that they're interested in that could be of value to the company. Now, this isn't easy to do. Uh, if it were, we, everybody would be doing it. But uh, for at least three reasons, this is not easy. First of all, organizations hire managers. They don't hire entrepreneurs. And uh, organizations tend to resist change. Uh, finally, they tend to also not have systematic mechanisms to encourage this. So intrapreneurs, people, and this is not just confined to the for-profit world for sure, uh, can try to um, still instill a sense of entrepreneurial behavior when they have knowledge of the internal and external environment. Knowing the external environment is important to be able to identify opportunities. Knowing the internal environment of the organization is important to figure out what the obstacles will likely be, what the politics they have to deal with 
is. They, of course, have to be visionary and willing to change the status quo. They have to be diplomatic because you need to get people on board within the organization, including people who have different areas of expertise, uh, have the ability to build a professional support network, even outside of the organization, and perhaps most importantly, the ability to persevere even in the face of uncertainty and setback. Now, and I wanna give you a role model of an intrapreneur uh, that I have come across. And uh, when you see what I just put on the screen, if you're thinking of Jesus of Nazareth, I think that's a very good thought. I think uh, this is good advice uh, at, at a general level. And I'm pretty sure if we, if we think hard, we will find proactive, innovative, and risk-taking behaviors in the life of Jesus. But that's a talk and maybe a sermon for another occasion. I am thinking of someone else who I actually met in Berlin and took a selfie with. Uh, and this is a guy called Jesus Del Val, uh, who works for this big fuddy-duddy uh, German pharmaceutical company that makes aspirin. It's called Bayer. And Jesus, who comes from Havana, Cuba, he arrived penniless in Germany many years ago, did a PhD, he's a scientist sort of bloke, but at Bayer, he came to the realization that it was important to start fostering a capability in digital health. And in 2012, he just started with this very small initiative to have meetups in Berlin and try to, to attract people with an interest in digital health to, to come along, many of whom were actually students. And the following year, he started a program called Grants for Apps, encouraging these young students to make apps, mobile phone apps, that could be, uh, that would have a digital health application. Uh, and so this was somebody who didn't have this in his job description. It's not even in his training. He's not a business guy, but he took it upon himself because he had an idea to be proactive, innovative, and take a bit of a risk to stick his neck out and get a program like this started. And so the question to be thinking about is how do we keep alive the spirit of intrapreneurship as our organizations mature? Uh, and I think that's as relevant to a, an organization that's over a hundred years old like CMC, as much as it, it, it is to a, a nonprofit in Bellor that's just about a decade old. As organizations mature, routines ossify, it's important to keep uh, revitalizing and renewing uh, a spirit of entrepreneurship within the organization. But good entrepreneurs realize that they can't do everything on their own. And that leads me to the second of the three mindsets, the collaborative mindset. There are three things that I have consistently seen a good entrepreneurs who are collaborative do. First of all, they leverage networks actively. This is sort of an extension of being proactive that we talked about. Uh, they are good at using networks reflectively. There is often a tendency to think of network relationships in a very narrow way. A network connection is good for me only if I get a specific opportunity from it, a job lead or a new business deal. And I think it's important to, to, to keep a strong focus on these kinds of benefits. But in the long run, the most sustainable benefit is actually what we learn through our network relationships and the knowledge we imbibe. And imbibing that knowledge actually is, uh, takes effort and uh, thoughtfulness. And thirdly, uh, people who leverage their network relationships well and collaborate well with others recognize that different network relationships are good for different things. Uh, I find the distinction that a professor at Harvard University, Robert Putnam makes very useful. He makes a distinction between bonding relationships with people who are similar to us on some key dimension. Uh, for faith-based organizations, it may be other faith-based organizations, and these relationships are good because uh, it's easy to build trust. But there is another benefit that comes from the actors that are dissimilar from us, the bridging uh, relationships, and that is novelty of information, ideas, uh, and opportunities. And so achieving a sort of a balance between these is often what is key when it comes to collaborating with others. And in a way, that's what I've been studying with large companies, working with small companies. They're 
both sets of actors are going outside of their comfort zone. Yet I, I will be the first to admit that this isn't easy. And, and what I find in my research is there's a paradox of asymmetry. The very differences that make highly dissimilar partners attracted to each other to work together also makes it difficult uh, for them to work together. And, and that is in fact what my book is uh, trying to address. But for our purposes tonight and uh, today, and uh, at this point, what I would point out is that collaborative entrepreneurs find a way around this. And I come back to uh, Jesus and his work at Bayer with the uh, uh, Grants for Apps Digital Health Program, which as I said, started in 2012 in a very small way. In 2013, they started giving away small grants uh, to, to students to, do, to develop digital apps. But then the realization dawned on Hesus that there was scope to collaborate in a, in, in a wider way. And so he started inviting a group of European startups to come and spend three months in a couple of offices within the Bayer building. And I, I've been there. It's nothing fancy. There was no massive addition of, of resources or anything, but they found the interaction with these startups mutually beneficial. In 2015, they opened this up to startups from anywhere in the world. In 2016, they made it a, a, a bigger a program. And then in 2017 and 2018, uh, added other elements to this and encouraged uh, Bayer uh, branches in other parts of the world, like Spain, Russia, China, so on, to follow suit. Uh, but do note, it started with a very small step that one individual took. Uh, and it reminds me of this quote by Simon Sinek, dream big, start small, but most of all, start. And I think uh, that's the intersection of being entrepreneurial and being collaborative, finding ways to get going by reaching out to dissimilar others. And I'm finding a lot of organizations beginning to think like this. My last business trip at the end of 2019 was to Israel. And one of the most fascinating organizations I visited was the Sheba Hospital there, which many of you I'm sure have heard about. And just a month before they had inaugurated what they call the Ark Innovation Center, which was one of its major objectives was to engage with digital startups in Israel to try to improve their technologies in the, for the benefit of patients. Another organization that you will all be very familiar with is Johns Hopkins University, which has an accelerator program to support uh, startups, both early stage and later stage. And of course, as an educational institution, it's trying to help uh, startups where uh, one of their students or alumni uh, are involved. Uh, and then uh, because of COVID, in fact, digital health startups and entrepreneurship has uh, had a boost. Uh, just last month, there was this article in the Hindu's business line uh, newspaper talking about this. And one of the organizations that I've come across uh, partners with Cisco, uh, the big IT company from California that has a, what they call a launch pad program in Bangalore to help uh, support startups. One of which is called Cloud Physician, which was, uh, set up in Bangalore by two uh, Indian doctors who, uh, who are intensivists who returned from the US and set this up to basically help provide remote support for ICUs, uh, not, in the, not in big uh, hospitals like CMC, but smaller hospitals in smaller towns. And uh, of course their services uh, were uh, used heavily in this period of the pandemic. And another very interesting um, digital, uh, digital health startup that I heard about through my work with Microsoft comes from Pakistan and is called Sehat Kahani, uh, uh, Story of Health. And what's interesting about it is not only do people who, not, who don't easily get access to healthcare, medical advice, uh, get access, but on the supply side, the doctors that they're tapping into are typically women doctors who stop working after they get married uh, and are now able to provide time at their convenience in a way that works for them remotely. And again, with the explosion of telemedicine, uh, this has been a huge help. And I think Dr. Ida would have greatly uh, approved uh, because not only does this uh, contribute to SDG three of good health, but also SDG five of gender uh, 
uh, of combating gender inequality. And of course, there are limits to what these startups can do. You know, nobody's going to be able to accomplish a surgery um, through these kinds of things. But my point is going back to Hezos and Bayer and these big fuddy-duddy companies, uh, they are clearly uh, trying to imbibe a collaborative spirit that takes them outside of their comfort zone. And so the question to think about is, how do we access and leverage external complementary capabilities, including from unlikely allies? And now finally, the third uh, idea I want to uh, briefly talk about is the notion of a global mindset. Um, you know, as a result of curiosity to know more about the world, the competence to be able to deal with different cultures and having connections, uh, people like Hezus at Bayer have been able to engage with startups in different parts of the world, Spain, Russia, China, the United States. But an example that I wanna give you is actually from Africa. This is a picture that Hezus posted of him with a guy called Braindolf Owusu, who he describes uh, as the Mark Zuckerberg of Africa. Raindolf and a co-founder set up uh, a, a company that they call Bisa, uh, which has a, it's a healthcare app that allows uh, people to get just some basic information and advice, uh, targeting poorer people who don't have access to healthcare. It was started in 2014 during the Ebola crisis when Ghana was uh, greatly afraid that uh, there would be uh, infections coming in from Liberia, which for them fortunately did not happen. Uh, but the BISA um, app uh, then got the attention of Bayer in 2016. Uh, Hezus invited them to be part of this Grants for Apps Accelerator in Berlin that we talked about. And so uh, Hezus introduced me to Randolph and when I went to Ghana, where my school has a small campus um, to teach, I had the opportunity to, to meet uh, Randolph and his co-founder. And what amazed me most of all was what a humble ramshackle building in which they had this little room in which they were operating out of. And I thought, you know, having had the privilege of, of visiting some sparkling startup facilities in the likes of Silicon Valley and uh, Israel and, and so on, um, you know, there are people who are working their socks off and trying to be entrepreneurial, trying to be collaborative uh, and have this global mindset, both in terms of these young entrepreneurs like Randolph, but also these intrapreneurs in larger organizations like Hezus. Now, it might sound a little odd for me to be waxing eloquent about a global mindset at a time when globalization has got bad press. Uh, and I want to take us back to the building in which I um, grew up and offer you two contrasting views of what globalization can look like. Um, on the one hand, there is the origins of this building as an indigo factory that was built by the East India Company. The East India Company, as Professor Jeffrey Sachs of Columbia University often says, is a model of exploitative, rapacious globalization. But on the other hand, this is also where CMC was literally a startup in 1900. And today, another nonprofit working in the area of mental health, the Christian Counseling Center operates. And coincidentally, uh, my dad, who is the director, uh, marks 50 years to the day when he joined uh, this organization as a young man. Uh, and so this is the sort of uh, selfless service that the CMC ecosystem has developed, which I think is, and you know, the forces of globalization facilitated the East India Company, but also the work of missionary families like the Scudder, the developments in transportation and technology and so on. And so for me, it's about how we harness globalization and make it a force for good. And so in terms of, of this global mindset idea, it is about how we imbibe and use the best ideas from around the world, which by the way, people uh, from the Bellor ecosystem have been very good at, but I would also just add, and not just from the easy to reach familiar faces, the English speaking West, I think there are interesting ideas uh, and inspiration to be gained uh, from elsewhere too.
And so as I wrap up, um, uh, as I see it, uh, these three mindsets together can help organizations revitalize in this decade of action uh, by cultivating intrapreneurs within, by engaging with partners on the outside and searching widely uh, for inspiration and uh, seeking to do this in, in ever more effective and smarter and fresh ways. Uh, but of course, there are always specific contexts that each organization faces. And so as we think about these, one has to obviously take into account the specific organizational culture, the resource constraints, the local realities that one faces. Um, finally, and this is my final slide, I discovered to my great surprise that last week was something called Global Intrapreneur Week. I'd never heard of it. And apparently, uh, you know, they described themselves like this from CEOs to shamans and so on. We're a platform to bring con together connections with unlikely allies. And I thought in that statement are these three mindsets that we just talked about. And uh, I wanna close with this quote from one of the speakers at this event last week. If we don't collaborate today, there may not be a playground to play on tomorrow. Thank you very much.